Fly fishing a big lake isn't always easy to do, but Stump Lake near Kamloops has got great shoals and good weed beds. That means the fish move in there to forage for food. It also means us fly fishermen can target the fish easier. While Stump is a big lake, it's located right beside the highway, has the good access. It's halfway between Merritt and Kamloops on the old highway. It's a big lake, it means it has big fish. So fly fishing Stump Lake, that's today, as we take you sport fishing on the fly. Everybody and welcome to this edition of Sport Fishing on the Fly. Well, today we're in the Caribou region up by Kamloops, and it's Stump Lake we're fishing today. And man, oh man, we've been uh, we've been just starting out. Had a couple of smaller fish on, and we were trying to trying to hunt them out. And actually, Grant's found a great spot here. He's just cruising along the shoal, and we came up with this real nice weed bed, about six to eight feet of water. Thought there's got to be some fish moving. It's early season. It's about 48 degree water. The ice probably came off here probably about a week ago, so it's a little chilly. But we hooked in to this nice fish here. Started off with some. We saw some real small black cronids and also some bigger, bigger black cronies coming off. Whoa! So we anchored up in this one area. We're anchored in about six to eight feet of water, and we're fishing very shallow. I've only got about five feet between my indicator and my fly. Grant just had a hit. Just had him on, and then. Whoa, and then this guy banged it. And here's the kind of the quality of fish you're gonna get in Stump Lake. And I wanna get this guy in, show everybody. Oh, what a what a pretty fish. Boy, he's nice. Healthy size. Right in the lip. Top lip. Oh, that's a nice oh, fish. Oh, that is. Oh, oh 20 inch net. That's uh, probably one 18 inch fish to start. Not a bad way to start the day. We'll just unhook them and get them ready to go. Barb sucks, comes out. Now, since this is the first fish of the day and he is a nice size, we're actually going to take a throat sample and see what he's been feeding on. So, we'll just have a a little look here, I'll get everything ready. Okay, make sure the pump is well lubricated. Let's get a hold of them here. Depress the pump. Insert it to there. Draw it. Okay, we have our sample. Oh, there he is there. Let's see that nice stump lake rainbow there. Oh, oh, oh look at that. Oh, and there he goes. He just wanted to take right off, so I'll let him go. And I have my my little sample here. Fill it up. Oh, he's got uh, got some real nice big damsel fly nymphs. Yeah. A couple of chronomids, but the majority of food items are dragonfly or uh, damsel fly nymphs. Yeah. Of varying sizes. Excellent. And there they are there. Wow, look into them again. Another beauty. Now, here's something that everybody should realize. We came out, fished for about an hour, found the real nice area to fish, got into a few fish. Oh, gee, that's a nice fish, another healthy one. And all of a sudden we caught a couple of fish and then it just slowed right down. We didn't have any luck. So, what I kept doing is I knew they were taking chronomids. We knew they were on the, the damsels and the cronies. So all I did, instead of changing flies, I knew they were hitting the one I had, I just lengthened my leader. I know I was in six feet of water, I was probably down about three to four feet on the first couple of fish I hit. That depth, whoa, whoa, gee. So what I did is just extended my indicator, so I went down to about six feet now, between five and six feet. I just cast this one out, first cast, just started swinging, and I banged this guy. So I think that's something that, it, very important for people to realize is if you are chronomid fishing and you're fishing a certain depth and you, it starts slowing down, either change up to a different pattern or extend that and go to a little different depth, either up or down. Just try a different depth and sometimes the fish are cruising at different depths. 
Oh man, look at how healthy they are in here. Clones here. Oh, Stump Lake, what a what a great place. And you know the nice thing about Stump Lake is it is right on the highway. Yeah. I mean the highway, I think it's 5A. Is that right? 5A? Yep, 5A, we're about halfway between Kamloops and Merritt. Yeah. Right on the side of the road. Right there. I mean the highway's yep. there. They got multiple boat launches for everybody. They've got a beautiful guest ranch, Stump Lake Guest Ranch. And it's just oh, it's just really nice. So you can do the luxury route. Or you can do like we did. We were just driving by, coming back from a shoot in Tofino. Thought, hey, this would be a real nice place to stop and do a show. Oh, I gotta get this guy and show everybody that. Man, that is a nice fish. All right, let's get this guy, and he's just barely hooked too, right in the, right in the side of the lip. Oh, and the... <laughs> what did I just say? <laughs> Good call. He's just barely hooked. Everybody can see him though. He's a real nice size. So. So much for the throat sample. Well, you know what we're gonna do right now is this fly has been so good. It's caught all the fish so far. It's a real nice black little liquid lace chronomid. And we're gonna go to the bench and tie it up. Today we're gonna to tie you up the black bomber. Interior lakes of BC have some awfully large chronomids, an inch and a half to two inches long. And this one represents that. Make sure you have these materials ready before you tie the fly. For the hook, we're going to use a size 8 Mustad C49S. We'll use some UTC 140 black thread to tie with, a large white C bead for the bead, some 8 aught red thread for the butt, some medium clear liquid lace over the black thread for the body, and for the thorax, some black thread. The first step in the fly is to tie in your red thread. So we'll proceed to tie in a red thread right to the back of the hook. Once we have a red thread tied in, we're going to take our medium clear liquid lace and tie it in at the very back of the hook. Pull it and stretch it as you tie in your red thread and form a small red butt section on the fly. We'll take our red thread and bring it forward. And I'm just going to whip finish it off at the eyelid of the hook. And now we'll take our black thread and tie it on and start forming the body. When we Form the body, I'm just going to go back and leave a red butt on the fly and build up my body with the, with the black thread. And make sure the body is nice and full. You want it fairly big because these are large chronomids. Now that the black thread is tied in, we're going to take our medium clear liquid lace that we tied in earlier and slowly wrap around or over our top of our thread to form the body. And we want to pull this quite hard to start, stretch it out during the very butt of the hook and as you work up the body you want to just ease off on the tension on your liquid lace to make it a little bit fuller just a little bit thicker now that the body's tied in we're going to wrap up the thorax and how we do this is just going over top of our liquid lace and what you want to do is taper it so it goes from the body up to the snow cone so there's no gaps it's a nice even taper just keep building up your black thread to form the thorax now the last step to the fly now is to whip finish and put a little head cement on the fly. And like I said at the start, there's a lot of these big black bombers in our local lakes. Make sure you have a few in your fly box at all times. Whoa! <laughs> a little guy goes airborne. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, hilarious. Oh, this isn't good right now. <laughs> How do you go for a big run? Oh, there we go. Oh, he got, oh no, he's still on. Well, you know what my theory is when fishing gets a little bit slow, most important thing to do at that point in time is ah, eat. And that's what I was just doing. I just finished a banana, I just took a bite of carrot. I had my water bottle, the lid off, and all of a sudden I see my, my strike indicator going down, and I got lying everywhere, and the fish is coming at me, and uh, it was a mess. But we caught up here and got this a little bit smaller fish, the smaller one. Don's been getting some just dandies today. You know, we talked about being in the good zone, and we just happened to pick, I think, a really good spot here today, and it's on a point. And it's around the weed bed, 
it's just a way in and out for the fish to go. We saw lots of damsels cruise and I actually went for a nice cruise through the through the weeds and saw a lot of damsels and a lot of maize. Of course Don throat sampled the one and he saw that, that it was full of damsels and maize as well. So you know the fish are cruising into the shallows but they don't like to sit in the shallows. They're going to go back and forth and there's a perfect channel for them to do that. That's just what you're looking for, a little channel for them to move in and out of the, of the shallows. I've got a, a 10 foot rod here today. It's a 10 foot five weight rod. Beautiful rod. I love the 10 footers too because you just get that little being in the float tube or pontoon boats like right today, it's got a little bit more extension in order to get that fly in, especially when you're using an indicator system like we are right now. Got the indicator and the weight and the fly. And just nice having a little extra reach to get everything out there. Okay, let's see if we can pull this guy up here now. Breathe a little air. Wow, what a what a fighter. What a scrappy fish. Come on. Oh, there we go. The dawn release today. Isn't that perfect. Get him close, he just barely got him left hooked. And off he goes. Oh, that's just great. Let's just see, make sure we got a fly there still. And I guess we didn't do such a good job because I can't even show you the fly. The fly's gone. Ah, a bummer. Well, fly's gone. Come on, <laughs> you got to tie a knot that works. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, actually, we, we got this new knot here. And actually, you know what? The knot just came undone too. That's not a good thing. Practicing a new knot. Not a very good new knot. No, not a good new knot. Anyway, what I think I'll do right now is I'll uh, retie on, then maybe we'll do a little chat about how we're fishing today. <laughs> There are three or four fairly common strains of rainbow trout that are stocked into many of the productive lakes in the interior and southern interior regions of the province. The most common stock that you'll see out there are called Panask. They're a wild native run of rainbow trout taken from Panask Creek and Panask Lake, which is in the southern interior of the province. These fish are insectivores. They like to feed on insects or invertebrates. The second stock of fish that you'll see stocked into many interior lakes are called blackwaters. The blackwater strain of trout originate from the Blackwater River from the central caribou region of the province. These fish are highly piscivorous, meaning they like to eat fish, and the province stocks them into many lakes that have a forage food base such as red-sided shiners, peamouth chub, or pike minnow. They also like to eat insects, so they're a very good fish overall for stocking into highly productive lakes. The third stock of fish you'll see in our lakes are called tensicates, and they're also a piscivorous stock of fish, like the black waters. And Tensicate Lake is in the central caribou region as well. And so these fish not only like to eat minnows or forage fish, but they'll also feed on insects as well. So they're an excellent combination in, in terms of their feeding characteristics to stock in many lakes in the province. Okay, well, we'll see if that knot is any better. Better be. So, I said I would kind of give you some hints as to what we were doing today. The water out of the road. Most important thing right now is we've had a lot of choppy water. Like we've had the rift, we've had quite a big rift at times. So I put on the big yellow chunk of yarn here. One guy thought it was a dry fly at the lake we were fishing at, but it's actually a strike indicator. And on a day like today, when you get a heavy rip like we've had, it's excellent because you get to see it, the little orange balls and that that we've been using, sometimes they disappear in the wave. So having that on is good. You see right now we're at about five feet, close back here, between five and six feet. So about three and a half feet down to where I've got my lead weight, and I got about a foot and a half down to where I've got my fly. That's the same fly that Don tied on the bench same fly we've caught all the fish with today. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna cast it out. The wind is blowing directly this way. I'm actually pointing straight downwind. So I'm not gonna cast directly straight downwind. I'm just gonna quarter it off or maybe an eighth it off, just a little bit. So let me just cast it down here. Just a little bit off. A little off center of where the wind's going. And what's gonna happen now is I'm just gonna hold the line in place and the wind and the waves is gonna pull the fly down until it's straight below me. And what you call that is a wind drift. And when we're picking up, all the fish is when they're wind drifting. Now we've been trying all, all the retrieves coming back in, doing the figure eights, the long slow pulls, but we're picking up all the fish 
when it's just doing this, this dead drift and wind drifting down below us here. So again, your boat, I don't know, an hour and a half out to the right-hand side to allow the wind drift to go down to get it right below you. Why, oh, jeez, another great fish. Why did you pick this spot? Well, you know, like you always talk about points. Yeah. There's a point right there. There's two bays on the other side. Okay. And the point you see right behind Don, right there, that's the point. And then just oh, off to the right-hand side, which is, I want to get it. Oh, no, my this, anchor rope. Uh-oh, there's fish here. Oh, yeah. There's, uh, there's weeds that start right down to the right-hand side. So it's just a natural place for fish to come into. Just gonna pan down here and look at the, uh, yeah, you can't really see the weeds down there. There's actually weeds starting right there. I think the reason why this is such an effective spot is because we're anchored in eight feet of water and we're fishing into the weeds. Absolutely. The big note here is the wind is at our back. Yep. So we're allowing the chronomist to drift right into that shoal area in the weeds and the fish are just cruising the edge and picking it off. And what a great way to what a great way to fish and another dandy fish. Ah, beauty. Man, oh man. Boy, Stump Lake, they got a lot of power in here. You know, and these are some of the this is probably the average fish you're gonna catch in here. I mean they're they're beautiful fish in here. These are all the these are all 18 inches, the ones we're showing you now. Oh gee, an awesome <laughs> fight. What a fighter. But I mean like we said, there's fish that are caught in the 10, 12 pound range and bigger. Oh, there he is there. Look at that. Another beautiful fish. That's got to be oh, a good yeah. 18 inches. Very healthy, too. Oh, yeah. Let's get him in. Boy, oh, boy. Another nice fish. Oh, that's that's close to 19. That one. That's almost <laughs> a, whoa, the size of the net. Oh, man. Oh, gee. Oh, there he goes. That was good Look at that. Is that a, <laughs> there's the great thing about a barbless hook. You don't even have to touch the fish if you don't want. Holy cow, two 18ers in a row, that was probably closer to 19. Well, today in the technology, we're going to take advantage of Dan from Outcast being here. Dan, thanks for popping by here in Trail. Thank you. We get a lot of people asking us about the Outcast pontoon boat, and the one thing we always say is it's the best quality boat there is. I mean, you're going to show us a couple of features here today on the boat that makes it the best quality boat. Sure. Yeah, first of all, we use um, a Leafield valve, which is uh, basically the, the top valve in the industry for whitewater or for pontoon boats. Out of about 2,000 valves at the factory, we may have one failure, but we always catch that in an air test because we do go through a 48-hour inflation test on each pontoon build. You also got another neat little uh, gizmo here that I think we're going to be putting into our kit at the end of the day here because you're going to blow this pontoon up here in a matter of seconds. Yes. Yeah, this is a, a LVM uh, pump that actually uh, it's just a great little tool to have with you that you just hook up to your car instead of hand pumping them up. You know, it may take three minutes of pontoon. Right. And this, uh, you know, you can just put this on. And that's all there is to it. Just comes right off the battery in your vehicle? Yeah. And awesome. it's actually a real easy deal. It is good to have the hand pump too to top them off because when you do put them on the water, you do want them very firm. Right. Just that, for high flotation. Well, that, that's a good point. I was actually going to ask that question because people ask, how firm do you want them? Do you over tighten them? Can you over tighten these? Yes, you can. You know, the, the general rule, which is easy, you don't need a gauge or anything else, but to uh, basically right in the center of the pontoon to take your thumb and just push in. And if you can push in about a half inch, that's, that's just a good gauge. If you're on the water, you know, it's usually cold enough that you're never going to have any problems. But if you do pull, pull it up on the bank and, and take a break or have a lunch break or whatever, right. you do want to watch it because the sun, you know, they will expand in the sun. Or if you're climbing uh, elevation in a vehicle, you know, if you climb two to 3,000 feet, they will uh, expand there. So you just, okay. you know, all you do is just pop the thing if you pull it up on the bank a little bit and uh, you're good to go. Good to go. The end of the day then, push it in, turn it. Yep. Deflates itself. Pack your gear up and you're ready. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Dan. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Some guys came over and asked us what we were using, and the one thing was you couldn't move around today. Yeah. You know, you couldn't go and find the fish. You had to wait for them to come to you almost, wasn't it? That's true. There's yeah. some days when you have to go and find yeah. them. But today, well, the spot that we were in at least, 
that's where the fish were cruising through there. Yep. So it's just best for us to sit there yeah. and wait. And not steady, but just every 10 minutes, you know, you get a hit or something happens. It's good, good enough action. action. Yeah. It was good. It was. So put Stump Lake on your list of places to fish because it's definitely worth oh, it. Oh, it is for sure. It can be punishing though. They get a lot of wind here. <laughs> oh, and yeah. We just happen to hit it right today. Yeah. There hasn't been a lot of wind, but yeah. we're told the last two weeks it's been like 25 mile an hour winds and steady cold. up here. Yeah, and, and cold. Yeah. So when you get a chance, so make sure you take care. And conserve the waters. Do a great job of fisheries management up in this Camloose area. Stump Lake's a great example of that. Yeah, you yeah. bet. See you next time. When we take you sport fishing on the fly.